pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Denise Murray, who is emerita from Macquarie University and also San Jose um, at University in California. Um, and Denise is a wonderful researcher. And uh, it's been so much a pleasure for all of the individuals who have been involved uh, working with uh, Denise because she's such a careful and thorough researcher. So I'll turn the time over to Denise and she'll tell you about uh, our wonderful project on online language teacher education. If I can get out of here. Um, I would prefer not to use the microphone because it's do it only moves with a long cord and I'm afraid my mother bore a very clumsy child. <laughs> and the last thing I want to do is trip and you know, land in somebody's lap. Um, but I know that a lot of people have tried using their voices during this convention and people have said they couldn't hear them. So, Ryan, you're right at the back. Can you hear me? Yeah. See, those people weren't Australian. That's the difference. <laughs> you're Australian and you're used to shouting over paddocks, I can assure you that the world can hear you. <laughs> okay, so first of all, I'd like to make um, some acknowledgements um, because although I'm supposedly the author of this, um, I really owe an awful lot to a number of people who have helped. And of course, the funding uh, would it would have been impossible without the funding, so I thank all the to donors and especially Anaheim University. I also want to thank Marianne as the liaison, uh, who is one of the most uh, generous, kind, and detailed oriented um, editors that you could possibly imagine. Um, however, as they always say, any errors that are still out there are totally mine. Um, and Kathy, who also is an amazing, amazing copy editor. Um, and last, lastly, but not least, Ryan, without whom none of this would have happened. Because every time I had a technical glitch trying to work with uh, getting the um, case reports downloaded or something, Ryan was always there to the rescue, even late Friday afternoon when he should have been home. So, Ryan, thank you. We owe you a great debt. Um, and there is a woman who did all of the pretty formatting, which you'll see um, on the website when you go to it. And that is quite remarkable, too. And uh, her name is Meredith. So in absentia, Mer Meredith, we thank you very much. Now, I know you all hate doing this, but you're going, this is going to be a somewhat interactive performance. Um, and I'm going to ask you, I mean, unfortunately, there are a few people up there already standing, but I'm going to ask everybody to stand. I know you hate this. <laughs> But after sitting for 20 minutes, you're all, you know, numb. Okay, so I would like the people who participated in the case studies to please sit. Okay, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you can't sit, right? Okay, if you've ever developed an online teacher education program, please sit. If you've ever taught in an online teacher education um, course of any sort, please sit. Okay. If you have ever been a student in an online teacher education program, please sit. Okay, so we have some outliers here. <laughs> so for the people who are standing, you know, when you get to talk later on, make sure you're beside one of the other people because there's loads of resources in this room of people who can tell you things that will make it much richer than my short presentation. So you can all sit now. Thank you. So as you probably noticed, I kept saying online. But what do we mean by online? Somehow or other, now have I got this on? Yeah. It was working out earlier. Okay. Um, we, we sort of assumed we all knew what online meant. Right? But do we? So I'd like you to just spend you know, a, a minute thinking to yourself, what do you think it means online? And then share that with a neighbor. And perhaps if there are two of you sitting together who have never worked in an online education program, then you might want to you know, turn around or make sure you talk to somebody who has. So I'll give you just a few minutes to to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
microphone to get order. Um, well, I hope you were on task and you were discussing that and not where you're going for dinner. Um, which, you know, we all want to do when we start talking to our neighbor whom we haven't seen for ages. Okay, so why did TERF want to do this study? So first of all, let's look at a few statistics. Um, most of these are US-based. It's really hard to get um, international data. Um, but the Sloan Consortium, which is a major consortium um, in the US, has been looking at online education. Uh, first of all, they did it in industry, and now they've been doing it in higher ed. And they say now that 32% of US college students are taking at least one online course. That is their latest report that it says 2011, but it just came out. And then the growth of MOOCs. Okay, what's a MOOC? Massive open online course. Massive online open, open online course. Okay? And the, the big word there is open, because it's open to anybody. Okay? Um, Coursera is one of the companies. There are several companies. Some of them are non-profit. Some are hoping to be for-profit eventually. Um, and they are... Um, this particular one, Coursera, I chose it for no particular reason other than they probably have the most. They've got 115 courses online, and they're from universities from Taiwan to um, Stanford to MIT to Australia, right? I mean, incredible number of universities are participating. 33 institutions totally, and 1.5 million participants. The interesting thing about the MOOCs is that at the moment they're not for credit, um, but people can say they have completed the coursework and you know they can uh, prove that to an employer, maybe to a college that's willing to give them some credit for previous work. And then just one small example in the U.S. in the state of Pennsylvania, they have gone madly online with a sort of a charter school program. And currently, in Pennsylvania alone, 300,000 students are online. This is in K-12. Okay, and then online, online language teacher education, which is what we're talking about and what this research project was about. Um, in the mid-1990s, there were about 20. Hall and Knox published their paper um, in 2010, but they, uh, the people they sent their information out to and their survey to was in 2009, and they had 120. And I actually found over 180. Okay? So the growth is quite phenomenal. So you can see why TERF might be interested in that. Um, I chose sort of a funny slide of a husband and wife or a boyfriend and girlfriend or whatever. I mean, they are male and female, I think. Um, you know, having dinner, a candle at dinner, and they're both there, you know, probably emailing... Um, their instructor, um, you know, looking at their coursework online, who knows, okay. So, um, the research questions that TERF asked were, what language teacher education programs are there online? And by programs, it was a very broad definition. It could just be a workshop, but anything that was language teacher education. And what are the key characteristics? Then at what levels? You know, were they degree programs? Were they in-service um, professional development programs? You know, what sorts of programs were they? And then what issues arose with these people um, in trying to deliver it online, and how did they try to solve it? So they were the guiding research questions that um, I was to answer. But for me, the big question is this one here. What is online? How do you find on, define online? And Marianne is going to um, help us define it. So you probably hear all of these terms or terms that are similar. So let's start on the right-hand side of the slide to web facilitated. So um, as you can see, um, the web facilitated would be if you have any percentage of your course available online. So even if you post your syllabus online and make that available so you no longer print it out, or you have students simply maybe um, access your, your um, PDF slides of your PowerPoint or whatever, that would be web facilitated. How many of you in here do web facilitated kinds of courses? Yeah, lots of you do, at least. Okay, and then there's um, a couple of terms 
hybrid and blended, and they're used in different ways. Um, the Sloan study that Denise talked to you about actually uses these interchangeably, or they're the same thing. But um, there are other ways uh, to define them, as you'll see below. So a blended course means face-to-face, -face on online, has, has online threaded discussions, and some file sharing. And that's a little bit different from the hybrid course, which has some face-to-face. -face. So there'll be a replacement of online for some of the face-to-face. -face. And a large portion of the course would, would be taken actually online. So these would be things where students would also maybe take quizzes or they would access discussions that actually counted for part of their grade. And then the, the term that we're using here is online. And we're going with this definition that at least 80% of the course must be delivered online. Okay. There's nothing like having the author that you quote in the audience. Um, Christine is actually... Oh, I keep turning it the wrong way. Christine is actually here in the audience. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so the next... Uh, whoops. So defining it, this is rather... Um, a long definition, but this was what was provided to people who we asked to participate in the study. <coughs> and I'll let you read it. I think everybody can see it quite well from the back. I thought you were going to say, I think everyone can read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> So as you can see, it's pretty broad, and it was to try and capture everything in the hopes that we would get some very you know, innovative and new um, ideas that were being used. Um, and as Marianne said, the 80% delivered online was the key for this study. Um, I mean, one could argue why 80%, but you know, I wanted to go with something that was already in the literature, and the Sloan Consortium is considered very prestigious, the work that they have done. So now that we've sort of defined the study, we've got the questions, um, who does it? Well, in order to find out who does it, you have to find them first of all, right? And I'll get to that in a moment. But I'm going to give you um, another task because I know you like to talk to each other. Um, <laughs> and I'd like you this time to describe any online language teaching education, only language teacher education. Right? Not instruction for um, students learning ESL or EFL, okay? Um, that you're familiar with it and share that um, with the neighbors so that everybody gets a sense of some of the programs that are out there in addition to what I'm going to tell you from the report. Okay, I'll just give you a couple of minutes to do this again. <laughs>
You know, it helps if you turn it on, Denise. Okay. And, you know, this is what I felt like. I really felt like Sherlock Holmes. It was really difficult to try and find people. Um, this is a list of the sorts of things that I did. Web searches using a variety of different terms. Not just TSOL or ELT. I mean, I used everything that you could possibly imagine. About 20 different ways that you can find a, some sort of institution that might be doing um, language teacher education. There are some web-based um, educational consolidators who, if you go to their website, they list you know, 200 people who are doing it, and you find half the links don't work. Um, <laughs> then I went to all the TESOL professional websites um, and the professional journals and newsletters in our field, um, including reading some books that you know, referenced various people, and then I got in touch with those people. I went to our Trinity College website and downloaded their entire huge uh, volume of um, course providers for 2012. And I, we announced the project um, at TESOL last year and at CATESOL and also um, online in the TERF um, website. And then I went to the distance learning accreditation websites. Uh, there are a number of those and I also searched those. As you can imagine, there were many, many dead ends. Um, it was, this was probably the most frustrating part of the whole project. Um, I found what I would consider 186 potentials, 106 of whom were, um, not, were universities, 80 non-universities colleges. And they were, as you can see, in quite a number of places. And they included not-for-profit and for-profit organizations. Some were very large, some were very small. But why did I only contact 140? Because the remaining 46, um, 30 had no email addresses on the website for direct. <laughs> ah, you might laugh. There is method in their madness. What they have instead is a form you have to fill in with your email, right? And I wasn't going to do that because you can imagine how my email box would get filled by these, how many was it, um, 30, you know, who would be wanting me to take their courses for the next 20 years. Um, I did get a special turf um, email for this because I was worried about exactly this sort of thing. The remaining 16 were part of a larger organization or appeared to be blended programs when I actually sort of read more about their program. And they, these were primarily for-profit institutions. Um, but however, 10 were universities, including two of the most famous in the US, Capella and Phoenix. And the only way I could get any, I, they don't even have on their website who their faculty are. Right, because that's what I had to do for some of the other, un well, I did this for many of the universities. Um, some of them, you know, have, you know, info at. Well, you know, info at never gets a response, you know that, unless I'm a student wanting to study there. Um, and I did do a number of those and got no response. So what I do is go into teacher education, applied linguistics, whatever it was where the program was, see if there was any name of a faculty member, and sometimes there was a name and an email. Great. Sometimes there was a name, no email. So then I had to do a Google search for that person and find maybe their publications or something that they had done where I was able to find an email. Um, this really took probably more time than anything else, was just trying to find people. Okay. Um, and I think it's interesting that these you know, big for-profit universities really don't want you to talk to them. Um, all they want is to get students. So I ended up contacting 140 people that I could reasonably find. Uh, 97 were universities and 43 were not universities. Okay, <coughs> so um, let me give you a breakdown of some of the providers. Um, this doesn't add up because there were some ones and I, there wasn't enough room on the slide. But if you have a quick look at that, I got a number of 
responses that people said, I'm sorry, I'm too busy, I can't do it, um, etc., etc. But I'll come to that in a moment. Okay? But these are the, the sorts of people that I, conduct, I contacted. So it's quite a broad range in a, a number of different countries. And there, as I said, there are more countries than that, um, but they were just one in the area. So what data do I need to answer the questions? And we'll come back to the 140 I contacted in a moment. Well, we decided that, um, remember the research questions? You know, how, do, how can I answer those questions? So we decided three data sets. One was a literature review, pretty obvious. One was a review of all these, web, these 186 websites and actually trying to get some sense of what was going on there, um, not just how frustrating it was to try and contact them, but what were they doing? Um, and I'll give you the results of both of those in a moment. And then the major um, part of the study was inviting case reports. And so those 140 people were invited to write a case report <coughs> for TERF, okay? And I explained what TERF was and so on. Okay, so um, I'll come back to them in a moment. Let's look at the literature review, okay? So I looked at a variety of li different literature because online language teacher education is all relatively new. And therefore, there is not a lot of research that has been done in this specific area. There is a most recent book by Liz England, um, which is you know, the first actual edited volume that's come out um, describing um, some programs. So I looked at online learning in general. And there's a, an enormous literature there, as you can imagine. Um, I did look at what is available on online language teacher education. And I also looked at distance education. Because one of the things that I found in starting to look at the literature was that for many people, distance education and online have become synonymous. Um, that is unfortunate because distance education has its own you know, life and a, a huge literature. And there are still many distance education programs in countries that don't have a lot of technology that are still paper or audio. Um, I mean, the old methodologies are still out there. Um, but it's unfortunate that many times people use the two um, interchangeably. And that Hall and Knox study that I quoted before, they tend to use it interchangeably. Um, and I really want to make a, a difference, a differentiation, because sometimes the online are in the same town as the institution that's offering the course. They aren't taking the course just because their distance, they're taking it because of time or some other less useful reasons, like they think, <laughs> like they think it's easier, um, and you know, because they won't have to spend time sitting in class and doing things. Um, and you know, I actually am very fond of distance education because I got my bachelor's degree uh, mostly through distance education. Uh, because as a 10 to 19 year old, I was sent to the country uh, 1,300 miles from my hometown to teach, and the only university was in my hometown. And so I had to complete my degree doing it by distance. Um, so, and Australia has been very involved in distance education. And although distance education is sort of morphing into online, I do think we need to separate the two. And then computer-assisted language learning, because there's a big literature there, um, and again, it has some messages to tell us um, about what online is like for language learners, which can <coughs> also uh, inform us about what it could be for a teacher education. Okay. Turn it on, Denise. Okay. Um, I'm always worried the battery will run out, so you know, while I'm talking, I turn it off, and then I forget to turn it back on. So these were the key issues that came up in the literature review. Access, a big one. No, is it possible to do online in some countries? Um, or just in, in some parts of countries where there isn't you know, high band? I mean, we think that the OECD countries all have this marvelous technology, um, but it tends to be concentrated among you know, urban, rich, you name it, right? Non-minorities, etc. This is true in the US, it's true in Australia, although Australia is going broadband throughout the country. It's been a major government initiative. Um, building community. 
that seemed to be a major issue and, and thread in all of the literature, that the online uh, students often and the faculty often feel very isolated. And building a community online is one way of supporting um, both faculty and learners. I'll use faculty or teachers sort of interchangeably. I'm not necessarily talking about universities when I say faculty. Um, the student life online. Oh, sorry, the intersection of technology and pe pedagogy. What pedagogy can you use with the technology that's available? What affordances does some technology provide that, say, face-to-face -face education doesn't? There's a lot of literature on that. And there's been a lot of work done just on, on online courses, um, but then there's stuff that has compared online with face-to-face. And the student life online, how, how do students feel about being online? What do they um, get out of it? Why is it useful to them? Why are they choosing that particular uh, method of delivery? Professional development for teacher educators. This came up over and over again, that many teachers and faculty were saying, you know, I wasn't trained in how to do this. I've got to change my pedagogy. You know, how do I learn how to do this? And some institutions clearly provide some sort of professional development, and many do not. They just say, okay, next week you're going to go online. Or we want you to develop an online course and don't give you any additional time to be able to develop it. And what was key in all of the literature was administrative support. And that I mean right from the top of the organization to, you know, secretaries to technical people, everybody, so that the institution itself sees itself as delivering online, not just as an added on, but as really part of its modus operandi. Not that that's all they do, they might still do face to face, but they have made a definite commitment to this, rather than just sort of um, downloading it to people uh, lower in the trenches. Okay. Yes, Denise, it is on. So why is it not working? Amen. Point it at the computer. computer. It should work anyway, but the battery is probably a bit low. So the web page, the review of the web pages, these 186. It is actually, if you start doing this, you will be dismayed at our field. <laughs> um, I, I say something in the. Um, Report. I mean, it's toned down from this, but it's sort of like um, back to the old Wild West. Um, you know, all I want is your money. Right? Um, some of the web pages are quite blatant um, about exactly what they want from you. And so let me talk about what I found. Um, but I'll ask you, first of all, to, you must have looked at some of these web pages. Okay. What do you think is essential? For a student, imagine that you're a student who wants to take an online teacher education course. What do you think should be on that web page? Okay, and again, just talk about it for a couple of minutes.
cup of coffee or tea or whatever. I mean, I, I hate this rows and column stuff. Um, so it, I really mean this to be a bit more informal than it appears from the setup of the room. So no, I won't at all be embarrassed if you get up. And only he's just bringing more coffee, so don't just get up yet, because then there's no coffee there. Uh, it was sort of a dumb time to suggest it, wasn't it? Now, would anybody like to volunteer for something that you said with your partner about what should be on the website? Anything? Yes, at the back. Practical experience. <laughs> okay, what technical support they're going to offer? Yes. Uh, what accreditation the program has. Oh, that's a good one. I'll be coming to accreditation. That's a great one. Thank you. Maybe something about my teacher, teacher profile? Teacher profiles. Good one. Another one. Anybody, anybody else have something? Yes. Yeah. Sorry? Bring his knowledge, you know, because depending on the course you are, yeah, what's expected from What's you, expected of you, okay. And, you know, what have you done before in order to enter the program, yes? I'm not sure if this is a, 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 a something that should be on that particular page, but how about how much? <laughs> <laughs> Seems obvious, doesn't it? Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Estimated time commitment and assessment techniques. <laughs> Estimated time commitment and assessment techniques. Okay, we'll dream on. <laughs> If you wish. Okay, so the analysis showed that the designs were sort of all over the place. Um, I mean, some of them matched the sorts of design methodology um, that has come out of the ITRAC studies from the Pointer Institute uh, that says the major content should be in the middle and links and on one side and um, on the other side um, the table of contents and it should be uncluttered. Uh, etc., etc. I mean, there's a lot of research that's been done on what is a good web page, and that's been done largely in industry to try and tell people in industry what their pages should look like. And some of them are like that. Some of them are so busy that you, you know, you get vertigo just watching it <laughs> because you know they have things flashing up all the time. You know, um, it's that's meant to catch your eye, but in fact, what the I track studies from Pointer Show is that that's not the case. It's, it's so distracting that people just get out of it. They can't bear it. Now maybe the generation of children we are now producing, uh, maybe they're born with different eye tracking from us. Um, and I don't know. Okay. Now, uh, the home, I, I did a particular analysis of the home page, the very first page, because that's where you make a decision of am I going to go further or am I not? And I determined, and this is me, this is not anything in any of the literature, that there are in fact three, oops, sorry, three major types. What I call sales pitch, inquiry, desk, and edifice. So you can imagine, the sales pitch ones are the? For profits. For profits. <laughs> okay, and they have, when I get my notes here, I wanted you to read some of these. They have some really interesting things. It's clear that all they want you to do is buy. <laughs> so, they say things like, in no time you can become an English teacher. <laughs> it, it, only, it only costs $59. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. Okay, um, it's good value, and then there are lots of testimonials from former students who are absolutely delighted in what they've done. Lots of appealing photographs, because research does show that people connect images they like of people like them, um, so this is to attract the sort of person that they want into it. The other area that is really interesting is Want to teach English overseas? Question mark. Need a TESOL certificate to fill out your resume? <laughs> Are you filling a gap year? Do you want to travel? They are the sorts of appeals they make. It's a real sales pitch to people who want something fast, cheap, and usually want to, you know, travel but work and get some money, right? I have another example here given by TESOL. 
Earn a master's in TESOL, the new school. Yes, okay, now that's a different sort, okay? <laughs> the inquiry desk is um, a little like the one that I said before from Phoenix and Capella, where they ask you all sorts of information that you have to fill in, right? Um, what do you want to do? How, what, are you, what is your background? I mean, and these I couldn't fill in because if I did, they would reject me because I've got a, you know, a doctorate in the field. But, you know, they, it's a pull-down menu. You know, have you got a doctorate? Have you got um, a master's degree? Have you got a bachelor's degree? Um, how many units in the bachelor's degree have you already taken? And then, you know, what is it you want to do? But I have no idea what their courses are. There is nothing about their courses. All there is is this sort of list of questions that I might ask I know, about me rather than me asking them. And then the edifice. Who do you think those are? Universities. <laughs> I mean, I chose these sort of emotive terms deliberately. Some of the university sites are just like universities. Silos all over the place. Hierarchies all over. I mean, so deep down to try and find the person who is teaching the course. Um, some of them have learned from looking at the sales pitch sites that, oh, maybe we need a dedicated site for our online program. And some of the more prestigious of the universities have done exactly that, and it's even a different URL. Some of them who really are wanting to see themselves as online providers have, you know, online, and there is a special button that you can immediately click, and then you go to all the courses that are available online. Some, they've got lots of online courses, but to try and find them is an absolute nightmare. I mean, it's just like a brand new, you know, graduate from um, high school arriving at a university campus and saying, okay, I want to take a course in where do I go, yeah. right? And many of them don't even have sort of what is like a notice board at a university. Um, I encourage you to go look at some of these because, you know, it's quite an education. The other thing, I mean, I met, sort of mentioned this under the sales pitch one, is that they appeal to the audience, and there are three major topics that they use to appeal. Let me get this right. Quality, job placement, yes. Quality, job placement, and travel. I've already mentioned travel, <coughs> but quality was a big one. These are some of the things that they talk about in terms of college, of quality. They talk about their reputation. But there is no proof, right? They all have a great reputation. <laughs> some of them have the qualifications of the teaching staff, but no names, but some do. The methodology for teaching is in some of the better websites. Their affiliation, including accreditation. The length of time it's operated. Interesting point, eh? Its value alumni testimony, and who hires its graduates. That's sort of the list of quality indicators that various websites use. But it's often proclaimed, I would say, through phrases like, and let me read it, internationally acclaimed, who says, <laughs> providing high quality, prove it to me, internationally recognized, by whom? A leader in English teacher preparation, who says? State-of-the-art techniques. Okay, well, what are they? But, you know, none of these questions get answered. Highly regarded. <laughs> Our programs are top-notch. Award-winning. Teachers are big names in the field. <laughs> Leading provider on the planet. <laughs> That's a fair amount of good spar, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, so while I'm on the quality issue, I really want to bring up that uh, question that that person over there uh, talked about, and this was in terms of you know, assuring quality, was the accreditation issue. This I found even more shocking than some of the other things. Um, a number of new online accrediting agencies have, been, have set themselves up, I would say, um, in order to meet this demand. And one of them, whose name shall remain anonymous, but you can probably find it, they've accredited courses in three institutions, all three of which are part of the same organization. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Another one credits both in-class and online TEFL TESOL programs and has accredited nine thus far, only three of which offer online courses. The one that I mentioned about the three larger three institutions that were accredited and it was, they were all part of a larger organization. When I dug down a bit deeper, it seemed as though the board of directors was the same for the accrediting agency as for the institution. <laughs> so just saying we are accredited by it doesn't tell you anything. You have to go look at the accrediting agency. Now there are good accrediting agencies out there. You know, there are ones that have been around for 50 years because they started doing distance education once, okay? So that's an, a real, be careful. I mean, all of this is caveat emptor, emptor. I mean, really, the buyer is in a very vulnerable position. So let's leave the websites because it's so depressing. <laughs> um, so I contacted this 140 after all of his searching and only 18 agreed to write the case reports. Five did respond and say they didn't have a program yet or they just started and therefore didn't have the data to be able to actually um, produce it for me. One said they didn't actually have an online program even though the website seemed to indicate they do. Eight this was, you know, and searching for people often ended up having to find a dean, right? And, you know, they forward it to somebody else and the, somebody else never replies. Now, I sent two emails to, I mean, I sent an email and then a follow-up email. So this isn't just a one-off. Um, one dean got back to me very nicely and said, oh, I don't, this isn't my area, period. <laughs> well, you know, you could have just given me the email of the person whose area it was. Twelve said they were too busy and didn't have enough staff to write. That I can understand, because when you see in a moment what the um, case study was, I understand that. Um, two were concerned about proprietary information, that this would go out on the web and you know there would be a competitive advantage. They would lose their competitive advantage because other people would start doing what they're doing. And 96, I got no response at all after two emails. Okay. Quite incredible, isn't it? So, the case report that these people were invited to do case reports, and in collaboration with the turf board, we set out the format. So there was no guessing what the format would be, um, and we even had a sample <coughs> that Kathy Bailey very kindly did for her online course, so that you know people could look at that and get some idea of what we were asking for. And these were the things that were um, asked of the people who did the um, case reports, is identify and describe the professional development opportunity. And we use this word PDO because you know, some of them were degrees, some of them were just workshops and so on. Um, describe the target audience. Describe how you recruit students. Describe the curriculum. Explain the goals and objectives of the course. Describe the teaching and learning activities including the use of technology in those. Describe the local context versus global context. Um, this came out of some of the literature for me, and I, this seemed to be an important point, that we are, <coughs> the students may be all around the world, and they have their own local context. How do they then bring that to this global interaction with all these other students? Because some of the studies were showing that students in less technology-rich um, areas felt very um, embarrassed that they weren't able to interact in, you know, on the discussion boards and, and do the various interactive projects that some of the faculty were asking them to do. Um, so we thought this was an important point. Um, how, how did they, the students in the course, deal with this sort of global reality, even though their teaching context might be totally different from um, what all the others were? And then they were also asked to describe how the course pro or the program prepared them for future teaching contexts because the field is very peripatetic. I mean, we go all around the world and teach in different contexts, uh, not just the one that they might be in at the time. And then the characteristics of the teacher educators, trying to get some sort of idea of qualifications. Non-teaching support staff, since that is you know, very important, and not only technology, as I said, but all the administrators. 
learning assessments, the mechanisms that you use to evaluate the professional development opportunity, because you know, as we saw, accreditation might mean nothing, depending on who is doing the accrediting, and what are the challenges, and what are the successes, and how did you document them? Okay? So uh, when you go online for the report, you'll find that there are links also to the 18 case reports. They are all online as well. So you can actually see what these 18 wonderful people did. Um, it's actually a couple more than that because some of them were written by two people jointly, um, you know, in producing this rich data for us. And it really was very rich data. Um, so the providers of the 18, Remember, we've gone from 186 to 140 to 18 now. Australia were two universities. Guatemala was a binational centre. New Zealand was one university. The UK, two universities. The US, two were from an association. Guess what association? <laughs> <laughs> one was from a publisher, and nine uh, were from universities. Now, the association one, you might think, well, why would there be two from TESOL? One, and they were submitted totally differently. One was submitted by central office about all of their online uh, professional development. The other was submitted by somebody from the electronic village and wrote up about how they train their people and, and so on. A very rich study, a very rich study. And one that is quite unique, not very, quite, <coughs> um, is the publisher, um, because this is the only program um, of all of these that is what Taylor defined way back in the what, 80s. There are two ways technology is used. It can be used as a tutor or as um, a tool. Right? A tutor means it takes the place for a while of the teacher. You're yeah. actually instructing online. And the, the publisher was actually using the computer as a tutor. Right? Whereas all of the other programs, they were using it as a tool. Now, one of the things I found interesting is that they, those two, three, four, were the only ones that weren't universities. What I'm most disappointed about is that despite emailing all of those, I've forgotten how many there were, of Trinity <laughs> College um, London program, certificate programs, none of them replied. And nobody from CELTA or DELTA replied except to say from two institutions, I'm sorry, we're too busy to do it. That is a huge gap in the literature. I mean, it's, I'm, but I tried and tried. In fact, one of the turf board who knows a couple of institutions in the, in the UK, which is where mostly CELTA and DELTA are taught, badgered people. <laughs> and no, no matter what we did, I mean, I even one particular institution where I actually did my very initial TESOL training back with their founders back in the uh, was it early 70s. You know, I even pulled this and said, you know, well, I did my training with you with da -da -da -da, back in the um, 1970s, and it would be so lovely to have you. And, you know, and I got back a lovely, kind email about, oh, it's so nice that, you know, you're in the profession, et cetera, et cetera, but we're too busy. Um, and I understand these are for-profit organizations, and... You know, it's not part of their job description. Universities are different. I mean, this counts as something. I mean, one of the things I got from universities pretty quickly was, can you give me the citation? You know, how do I cite this? Um, and I have to get back to them now that it's online with exactly how to cite both my uh, white paper of how they're included in that, because there are summaries of each of them in the white paper, and also their own publication that's up online. Okay, so what did we find from them? Oops. Now, Denise. The audience for OLTE. Um, who are the students? Right? Because we asked, what is your target audience? And we got various replies from different organizations. Sorry, I need to have some water. Some people were clearly totally online and choosing people worldwide. Some were set up because there was a particular, um, some sort of initiative that they had. Uh, one particular institution was working with the State Department for a, a project with uh, Africa at looking at people with very little um, technology and teaching the sort of um, major people in the field how to do project-based learning. Right? 
So, you know, very different audiences from these institutions. Quite, quite different. Um, some, you know, they had teachers in their accreditation program, um, and they discovered that, you know, some of them were already working, and they needed to uh, do some additional credentialing because they wanted to um, add <laughs> ESL to their uh, credential, and they didn't want to come back to class, um, even though they lived, you know, down the road from the university because they're teaching all day. Okay, so a wide variety of audiences, pedagogical choices. People made very different pedagogical choices, but one common theme was this notion of communities of practice again that I mentioned before. That is something that people really did talk about. Um, and they tried to achieve this through things like collaborative projects, through peer reviews, videotaping of teaching, which was shared with everybody. Right? So a variety of different methodologies were used to try and create some sort of community of practice within this online group, even if they were um, so remote. The technological cho choices are quite interesting. Many institutions did not choose synchronous at all and made a, a point of saying, we do not, everybody's all around the world, and it's impossible because of real-time uh, time differences. Some institutions have deliberately chosen real-time synchronous because they want to have that you know, real-time interaction with their students. Some have taken a sort of a middle ground and have had all of the delivery um, only asynchronous, but have had synchronous with maybe chat or something for, uh, for teachers talking to the student um, and you know, sort of like office hours and, and helping the student. And some of those were actually um, synchronous. Um, and then some people realized that you know, there were technological problems for some students in areas <coughs> where there is censorship. Um, they can't actually download a video of somebody else's teaching. And so, you know, people resorted to email attachments to try and get round things like that. Or the bandwidth wasn't very good at the other, um, wherever the student was, or it was expensive, and the student couldn't stay online for very long, and so some of the material would be sent instead as an attachment, and some would even send it in hard copy if all else failed for the student. So there a variety of technological choices based primarily on the audience, on who those students were and the constraints that the students had. We're back to quality. That came up over and over again, that people worried about perceptions of not quality in online education, and they tried to show their quality. Um, and they used a variety of tools for this. I mean, they evaluated their programs through student um, surveys, through um, uh, faculty sorry, alumni surveys. <coughs> they looked at what alumni had achieved when they left the institution. They looked at successes that the faculty had had, awards they'd received for you know, instruction and so on. Um, the other thing about quality that came up uh, far more than I would have expected was the question of disruption of technology. And these were, this is why I go back to this administrative support issue. It was the university decision oh, we're going to change from Blackboard to X, or Blackboard has suddenly, you know, put out Web 2050, and, you know, we've got to suddenly change everything. And people found that both the students and the teaching staff found this the most disruptive aspect. You know, when they were talking about what were the, what were the challenges, there were a lot of other challenges, but this, one, this theme came through over and over again, and they were nearly always ones that were per perpetrated by the institution, yeah. Yeah. not by the fact I see you're all agreeing. Yeah. <laughs> well, since they always used to do that in our face-to-face -face life, why would they do it any differently? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, they also talked about, which is true of face-to-face, -face, the nexus of theory, research, and practice, you know, and how to make that work. And because some of the institutions did not want to have a practicum for various uh, logistical reasons. They chose to only have students who already were teaching in some way, okay? Um, others had a practicum, 
um, and it could be done in the student's country because they um, had arrangements with the, that, those countries. These were largely ones which had particular cohorts coming from countries that they had dealings with. Um, others, you know, left it up to the student to find a place, and as long as there was a mentor teacher and the mentor teacher was willing to report in, then that was okay. okay? But this issue of practicum is clearly a, an issue for beginning uh, people in the field for OLTE, right? And so if you think back to those $59 um, 20 hour, no, these ones are about 10 hour <laughs> courses, I mean, what practice are they getting? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, I just didn't press hard enough. So, in conclusion, am I really right? The findings from the three data sets were the types and characteristics of OLTE. There is not one model, as you can see. It goes from everything from sort of T cell workshops through to doctoral programs. Okay? And they're all over the world. Um, they all look you know, very different from each other. Um, and the 18 are sort of representative of what's out there, except for this huge omission of, well, actually, I, I missed one. I omitted another one. The Trinity and um, Delta, and also Canada. Um, there are some programs I discovered from the um, TEFL Canada uh, website None of those responded to me. Um, the institution which um, is their distance learning program at Athabasca University actually outsources uh, the different courses. And it is actually done by a French-speaking university in Quebec. They were very sweet. I mean, they got back to me multiple times, but were just, just stuck. Well, theirs was not a proprietary issue so much as they felt that it would be... Um, the word, misleading, to have a case study in there. They'd do a survey, but they wouldn't do a case study because they thought that it would be advertising that they really were open to the world. And they said they are, but feasibly they're not because students who are not Canadian have to pay such a huge fee. And they felt it would be false advertising. I thought that was a very um, ethical sort of position for them to take. So I'm very sorry they're not there. And another institution in Canada uh, is just starting, and so they did not contribute either. So the trends that I see in all of this, this appropriate candidates again, you know, who is it best for? You know, and clearly people think that it's good for somebody who is at a distance like I was when I was trying to do my bachelor's degree, for busy workers, for people who you know have a job full time, want a qualification, but you know don't want to give up their job in order to go to school, and that seemed to be you know and that they there is a fair amount of technology in their environment. This seemed to be agreement that they were the main um, issues here. Um, it's clearly a very rich environment for many many people, uh, but not as some of the um, writers said. Some of the students don't really take advantage of it. Don't take to it. And in some of the other readings I'd done, uh, some students, as I said, do take it because they think it's a lot easier. Um, but the time commitment is so huge for both faculty and for students um, that, again, your point, that this ought to be up there on the website, but then nobody would take them if people realize. I mean, they are a real time suck. I mean, I've taught online. I mean, I know what it's like. Um, I, it takes a lot more time to produce such a course, and then it takes a lot more time to teach it. Um, developing communities of practice. This clearly is essential. I mean, we need soon to look and talk to students, but you know, from everybody who has reported back, it seems that com developing a community of practice among the participants in the program is really vital to students both learning and feeling comfortable with the technology. There are little stories about you know, students helping each other when the technology broke down rather than you know, waiting for the tech people to do it and you know, telling each other how they could do this quickly. They're more tech literate than I am. Then the intersection of technology and, pe and pedagogy. I know, what pedagogy do you teach that the technology does it better. I mean, you, it may be that it doesn't matter if it's the only way the students can come here. But you know, what affordances does 
the technology give. Um, and now, now we have, you know, high definition video. But if you do real time, what that sort of defeats the purpose in some way of students who can't come because they're in a different time zone, or students who you know are working all day. So how do you then juggle that as an institution so that the students can actually participate in synchronous activities, which are clearly, from what everybody is telling me, are richer and a richer experience for the learner. But how do you juggle that with their other needs? And this issue of quality. I mean, that I think is probably the one that staggered me the most. Um, it's just how important it, I know how important it is, but how people are actually trying to prove quality um, seems to be very amorphous at the moment. So, <coughs> when I talked about this, how many of you who have taught in um, or taken a course in online, online language teacher education have experienced issues to do with quality? Remember I said that it included you know, the institution suddenly changing the technical platform you were using. How many of you have experienced it? Yes, yes. How many of you have worried about how to use the pedagogy that you really think is appropriate, but how to fit it in with the technology? How many of you have really spent time focusing on communities of practice? Yeah. And how many of you worry about whether the students that are being targeted by your institution are the appropriate ones for an online course? <laughs> ah, yeah, even more for that. Okay, so as I said to a couple of people who came in all excited about this, you're not going to learn anything new, um, but it's nice to have it confirmed. Some of the things that we sort of, we personally have experienced are confirmed by a larger study. So now I believe I'm... Where to now? Having done this, what do we still need to do? Well, we certainly need to hear from learners, I think. Uh, instructor attitudes and experiences, I think we really need to dig deeper. I mean, it was many of the people who responded were teachers in the program, but some were administrators. The participant attitudes and experiences, you know, how does the learner really experience this? Find out about the technical support. I mean, they're just not there in the core literature. I mean, nobody seems to interview them to find out how they're dealing with it. I mean, they're the ones who get called on when the institution suddenly changes its platform. Right, David? <laughs> you know, how do you get instructor-participant interaction and, of course, participant-participant? Looking at learning outcomes. Are there learning outcomes in addition to them learning how to teach language? And I think there are. I think there are other very interesting intercultural communication outcomes. But, you know, I, we need to hear that from the learners themselves. Um, cost effectiveness. I mean, that is a big, big issue. Um, the washback of the online pedagogical strategies to classroom practice. Have you started doing things online that you sort of think, oh, I could actually do that in class, right? Yeah, I'm seeing some nods. So these are things I think really need to still be investigated. This is early. Lots of PhDs here. Any PhD students? Lots of nice topics for you if you're interested. <laughs> okay. Now, um, let me show you a slide that I think sums up everything I just said. what people do, how they do it, and what it means to them. This is what we need to be looking at. Okay? So I have this um, TERF Online uh, email for the TERF project. I have another persona, <coughs> but um, I've been using this for the TERF Online. Uh, we're going to ha have a discussion in just a moment. But there was something I had to say. Oh, you're going to say it. <laughs> okay, you can say it right now. <laughs> Just that if you'd like more uh, refreshments, um, please do help yourself and help yourself uh, when we finish with the discussion. But we would so like to thank our colleague, Lorraine Matos from the Cultura in San Paulo, who was 
um, <coughs> responsible for making certain that we all had a little uh, refreshment this morning to go with our <laughs> online <laughs> Can you stand? I just want to ever so Lorraine is uh, on the turf. <laughs> I need to say too that Lorraine and uh, Michael Carrier gave me good feedback on, and some other turf board members who were anonymous gave me some good feedback on my first draft of the white paper. We're going to ha- open it to discussion, but we want to focus the discussion. Um, so we've put up some focused questions based on what we just talked about. And so when you ask a question, could we ask you please to respond as to which of these you're addressing so we can sort of you know, keep everything, you know, I need to keep it conceptually in boxes even though boxes always are like this. Um, they never really are separate. Okay, so any questions, discussion? I mean, you can, a statement about what you've done, what you haven't done. Lorraine, thank you. Uh, okay, I'd just like to make a point as um, I'm an employer of teachers, and in a country with a critical shortage of teachers, which is Brazil. So in terms of appropriate candidates for OLTE, um, if we don't have OLTE courses, it's very difficult to prepare our trained staff, and it's got to be as synchronous, because we have teachers working in the morning and the afternoon at night, they have Sunday classes, and I'm thinking of opening Sunday classes as well. Why not? <laughs> And I'd just like to say that um, our staff actually take the Anaheim University course, and we do, apart from the Anaheim survey, we do our own survey because, I mean, we're putting our hard-earned bucks into paying for these courses. We've done hundreds uh, of courses through Anaheim University. And what I measure, I measure two things as an employer. One is stickability. You know, so if, if, if your uh, teachers don't, continue the course, you know something is seriously wrong. And the second thing we then measure is the impact in the classroom <coughs> through teacher observation. So um, the more better courses there are on the market, the better it is for, for us countries like Greek countries where we really do suffer from a lack of teachers and a lack of teacher trainers. So as we have scarce staff in our academic departments, scarce resources, it's fantastic to be able to buy in other resources from other organizations. And Lorraine made a very interesting point to me that she looks for what is the technology being used and the pedagogy being used, that those are you know, key issues uh, for her in choosing <coughs> programs for her teachers. And just one thing, I remember Lorraine said to me, her teachers were quite savvy about that and they don't want text online. No. You know, so no. they really want this communities of practice and they want to interact and to have many of the features that we have in face-to-face encounters in the online environment. Yeah. Um, I was, in regards to te- pedagogy, the number three. A big loud voice that I won't have um, to repeat. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, these practicums, if they have any teacher online practicums. I mean, like there's, most of these teachers teach in a classroom, but it would be interesting to know if, as a teacher uh, student, that you could actually do online practicums. Good. What a good question. None of the 18 case reports had that. But is there anybody here who has thought about that and envisaged doing it? Christine? There are, so, there are indeed several online. And at St. Michael's, we actually had somebody who was willing to prepare a course. Unfortunately, she passed away. And uh, one of those was supposed to be with, or <coughs> slated to be possibly with uh, somebody that we send uh, students to for practicum in Morocco. So we have Gary Kutka, who is one of our mentor teachers in um, I don't know, the center, the American Library Center in Morocco. And we were thinking about how to uh, just deliver this part, okay, and have videotapes or you know, video recordings, I shouldn't say tapes, but video recordings uh, of the actual instruction um, either deposited in the course management system or mm-hmm. you know, it's definitely being done and it can be done. Well, some did do the videos, but I thought your question, I yes. interpreted it differently, but yeah. um, did you 
and give me clarification if I, I'm wrong. Did you mean actually having a teacher do teach online mm -hmm. yeah. and that be their practicum experience? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. This, this was going to be that sort of thing. So the uh, course was by the instructor uh -huh. who would then uh, connect with the person, uh, the mentor teacher, and the practicum student. Him or okay. <coughs> they would cover both. Okay. Does anybody else have any experience of having done something like that? Uh, it's a very interesting sort of wrinkle and take. <laughs> yeah, we do something sort of like that. Not exactly, but um, in our. I, in, I'm in a department of languages, and so with our foreign languages, we have Spanish online, we have French online, uh -huh. and what we do when we do our evaluations <coughs> of those instructors, but it could be done, I suppose, in a pedagogical sense with an online mm -hmm. teacher training as well, it, is we put that person into the course site as a, you know, either as a student or as a uh, teaching assistant or something, you know, but give them a role. Um, within that course site in order to put them in. And then they can actually see what all of the materials are, see what the students are doing and so forth. I don't know, you know, how many, how well it would work within a teacher training thing, but it's something you might consider. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Tony from the British Council. Well, one of the things that interests me is that we say, you know, when we're recruiting teachers, we say we've got to have uh, a qualification, a minimal qualification, 100 hours of input and a minimum of six hours observed teaching practice. And I was wondering, when you were looking at the, the frankly, <laughs> disappointing yeah. number of responses you've got, um, did you make any kind of distinction between whether the online courses were offering any kind of methodology for, for looking at classroom yeah. teaching? Did you make that distinction? No, I mean, I, that was one of the questions that was asked, was, you know, what sort of um, assessments did they use and what sort of uh, teaching and learning? And they, you know, said whether they had a practical... We, the, the, the way the um, case reports were formatted, I just gave you the major heading. There was an explanation of what all of this meant, and one of them included, you know, do you have a practicum? So everybody did respond to that who responded. The 18 did respond. Majority said yes. No, the majority said no. <laughs> right, because they were taking in students who were already teachers, and that was a deliberate yes. choice on the part of the institution. So when you say they were already teachers, they were state qualified teachers who wanted to learn about TESOL. Right. No, they're not. No, no, no. They're not always that. Actually, I'm the Popular Classical University, and I was, I'm a case study. And that seemed to be the position taken by those who required people to have had teaching practice um, beforehand, was because they wanted them to bring that experience with them into the particular online course that they were doing. So I have a couple more comments, and then we have some closing things that we're going to tell about yeah. future. Yes, yeah. this gentleman here has had his hand up for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious to know how the other programs have trained and mentor uh, online instructors in terms of pedagogy and technology? Well, from the research, some of them had training um, for you know, everybody before they could possibly um, 
go into a cl online classroom. Um, others did not, and that was often because of the institution, or you know, um, making a decision because you know it, it's often expensive to do that. Um, and you know, many set up you know sort of a mentoring. I remember one uh, had a sort of a ment mentor who had already taught online, and therefore that person helped. So there are a number of different models out there, but that is key. I mean, they did. All everybody did say that it's. Professional development for the teachers is important. Okay, yes, you had your hand up. First. I think a really interesting question is uh, it relates to both the business side and the scalability, but then also uh, the difference. So, what I'm thinking about the difference between taking an online course and what the university offers, for example, Blackboard or something that can be scaled up and the university can control, but then making sure that your teachers have training and these more social and free. So I think that that washback question you asked is really interesting because I'll be a student taking an online course of things that are very kind of like locked down, maybe more like a blackboard or a course management system. But then in the K through 12 situation, I'll need or an EFL situation, I'll need to think on my feet. So I don't know whether the, the mm -hmm. what we're using to teach our online courses may not help teachers actually problem solve when they are in a context that doesn't have. That's a good question, and some of the um, programs did have an institutional LMS, but added on and used a whole variety of other uh, free uh, ways of inter interacting, um, because they realized that you know Blackboard does cage you in. I mean, you have to do it that way or or no way. Um, and so they used a variety, and, and if you look at the case reports, some of them are actually named in there as the different types of things that people have used. What were some of the things you used, Kathy? Can you remember? We used Illuminate. Illuminate, for that's right. Conferencing, and um, in another context, we used uh, Go to Meeting. We also used a lot of recordings done by Audacity. And a, a lot of people used Skype. Yes. So, and this will have to be the last question, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. It's actually a comment referring to uh, how to set up uh, training teachers, how to set up online teacher education courses, and so on. At my particular university, we have two colleges within the university. Actually, we have, yeah, we do. One is called University College, one is called COSI, a College of Online and Continuing Net. And they're actually functionally, budget-wise, and everything else separate which is very unusual and mm -hmm. was a, a very painful process for most of the university to go through. Mm -hmm. um, but the online, uh, or COSI, offers training to any faculty member mm -hmm. at any point in time mm -hmm. to help them in developing hybrid and online courses. And the School of Education has worked with COSI to now offer a teacher ed program online, not in OLT, uh, okay. not yet. It is coming down the road, I think. Um, okay. There are two reasons for that. One is the, the school of ed wants to grow. Two is the university wants money. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, um, so I want to wrap up with, um, there were two things. One is um, we are about to engage Marianne and I in a complementary study um, given the response rate of 18, uh, and you know, Fiona is right. I mean, it was quite a, a lengthy screed that people had to do, and I do understand those who said they didn't have the time for it. But I'm so grateful to the 18 plus who did. Um, but we're going to do an online um, survey, um, so that will ask many of the similar questions. But the people who are worried about the time, about proprietary, we're hoping that we'll get a much bigger N as a result. But I also know that probably in the last few months, other people have started doing it. So if there's anybody here who was not one of the 140 contacted, um, now your dean might have been, <laughs> you know, or your department head might have been, but they never got in touch with you. Um, and you are doing something that you know, meets the 80% criterion, uh, would you please come and give me your card afterwards so we can add you to the 140 database emails that I already have? I'd really appreciate that. Okay? So thank you all for attending.